SG552. Hi, Misha here, and lately I've kind of felt like bringing back the gun and model videos. So today, let's talk about Switzerland, specifically the Swiss Luftwaffe, the Swiss Air Force. So I have, well, three slash four guns, and three of their primary fighter interceptors have seen service since the late 60s so here we have the French Dassault Mirage 3 and then we're going to talk about the pistol 65 which is yes the Walther PPK but it has quite an interesting Swiss service history. And then we will talk about the Northrop F5, the Tiger, and the Pistol 75, the Swiss military P220, followed by the McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing, FA-18 Hornet, they use both the C and D versions, and this is current issue today, and then we'll talk finally about the STGW-04 and 07 series as they pertain to the Swiss Air Force, just for fun. These are original PPKs, but of course they're not Swiss. This is a Swiss manufactured 220. This is of course one of the recent JDI 552s. These three models are 172 scale die cast metal. This one is an old one from Falcon. And these are from Hobby Master and their current manufacturer, current production. So yeah, this is just kind of a relaxed hangout video. I just really like talking about history, and so if you do too, why don't you join me for a bit? And with that, let's go back to the 1960s. The French Dassault Mirage Three was Switzerland's first real modern advanced jet fighters. Of course, it wasn't their first jet. They would use the de Havilland Vampire and the de Havilland Venom. And one you really have to at least mention is the Hawker Hunter. Because they kept it in service for so long, between 1958 and 1994, the Hunter served. First is a fighter interceptor but very quickly it would be switched over to more of a ground attack support role which it really excelled in their version known as the mark 58 and later the mark 58a sometimes the f-58 was based very heavily on the british f-6 in fact many were converted f-6s Later F-58As were actually upgraded FGA 9s, Mark 9s, which this model from Corgi is here. Anyway, they would um, first order 100 in the late 50s, and then 60 more would be added in the 70s to the fleet. And these were in service by 1960. And they worked okay as a as an interceptor, but this was a subsonic or at least transonic at best aircraft, capable of reaching about 0.9 some odd Mach. 
with a maximum altitude of around 50,000 feet. It had four 30 millimeter cannon. And one unique thing about the Swiss version is it was outfitted where it could use all four underwing hardpoints for bombs. And then in 1963, they were reworked to carry two AIM-9 Sidewinders. While it was a good sturdy craft, it had limited fuel. And again, it's quite slow. So with that, around 1960, the Swiss government started looking what to do next. And they considered the Swedish Saab 35 Drachen, but they quickly settled on the Salts Mirage 3, which was a very cutting edge fighter with very impressive specs for that era. So in 1961, they voted to order 100, and these were to be built in country by the uh, Federal aircraft factory at, at Emmen, and to get things going they purchased one Mirage Mark III or Mirage III from France. But the Swiss version was to have some changes. Essentially it was made stronger all around to handle the short takeoff and landings necessary in the Swiss Alps. Also, it was made where it could be easily moved around by crane because the Swiss Luftwaffe would keep its aircraft in underground caves, caverns for protection, concealment, and, well, it's Switzerland. They have mountains. So it had to be reinforced, almost like an aircraft that was expected to do carrier takeoffs and landings. And... There were a few other changes, for example, instead of having a French fire control group and radar, it would have an American one. Initially, this would allow it to use the AIM-4 Falcon missile. Later, it would be used with the AIM-9 Sidewinder. The Mirage has five hard points in total and can lift about 8,000 pounds. It was primarily bought as a fighter interceptor. Although, originally they considered it would have a secondary role for reconnaissance and ground support. Again, they're planning to have a hundred. But, this resulted in a big old scandal. Good times. People resigned. Uh, it went out of control. Budget went crazy, nearly doubling what it was supposed to cost. So, ultimately, instead of a hundred, they only built... 36 of the 3S fighter. And originally they thought the same airframe could do reconnaissance duty as well, but that didn't work out. So they had to build a special variant, the 3RS. And they would build 18 of those. They also had two 3B trainers acquired from France. So this was not nearly enough, about half of what they originally projected meaning it never really took on its secondary role for close air support, ground attack, and they really did not even have enough to fully defend Swiss airspace. That meant the Hunter would have to continue in both roles as well. Nevertheless, the first ones appeared in the Air Force in 1964. These were the two-seat trainers. By 1967, the fighter interceptor was in service, and by 1969, the reconnaissance variant was in service. And in service, they had a good reputation. I mean, this was a very fast aircraft for that time, capable of Mach 2.2, had a max altitude of over 56,000 feet. The, like I said, the Swiss version carried two AIM-4s originally, later two AIM-9s. It had two 30 millimeter French Defi cannons. It could carry up to three fuel tanks. Yeah, it was agile and small. Um, it worked well in the cave systems because it was uh, under 50 feet long, but it only had a wingspan of 27 feet, meaning that it was easy to kind of get in, in and out and um, work from air 
strips of less than great length or even work for them, um, say, highways. Same, a similar concept to Sweden, actually. So even though there was a big scandal and they only acquired about half the aircraft they really needed, at least the ones they got, worked out okay. In 1985, running through 1988, there was a big upgrade program for the uh, Mirage here. In fact, a lot of work was done with the help of Israel, including adding canards, updating many of the systems, and adding compatibility with other ordnance. It's worth pointing out that the Hunter II was upgraded with the Hunter 80 program around the same time to expand its usefulness and ordnance compatibility. And both would continue on in service for quite some time. And of course, pilots of other aircraft would need a sidearm for defense in case they were downed, and just because they were officers. So with that, let's look at the contemporary handgun of the Air Force during this period. Even before the Mirage 3S was in Swiss service, the Walther PPK had already been adopted known as the Flieger Pistol 65, Pilot's Pistol, Model 1965. It really was just an off-the-shelf, standard production line, Walther PPK. Well, technically, it was a PPK-L, at least initially. We'll talk about it in just a minute. And it would have the regular Ulm markings, and then in Switzerland, it would be given a BP stamp on the slide and barrel. And then a WK stamp with a Swiss cross on the frame to show acceptance. And that's about it. So why did they need a pilot's pistol? Well, by the 1960s, this was the standard, of course. The pistol, 1949. The P-49. SIGS 210, specifically the 210-2, a very high-end pistol, but no, not exactly well-suited for pilots. It held 8 rounds of 9mm, single action only. It weighed 35 ounces unloaded, 8.5 inches long, with about a 4.8 inch barrel so it's not exactly a small gun well in 1964 Carl Walther introduced or rather reintroduced a lightweight version of the PPK now of course the PPK was introduced as a compact version of the PP in 1931 but these had steel frames but early on in the 40s, they did work with making an alloy frame, which this is here, called Dural during the war. But because, well, World War II didn't exactly go the way for the Germans, only a few were made. But the idea was resurrected in the 1960s after they had success with the P-1 pistol for the Bundeswehr. So in 1964, they introduced the PPK-L an alloy frame version of the PP. And this almost instantly interested the Swiss Luftwaffe. And that's because it had a number of advantages over the standard P-49. For one, it weighed 17 ounces. So <laughs> half the weight, even less than the standard pistol. It was also much smaller, it just a hair over six inches had a 3.3 inch barrel and it held seven rounds although of course this would be 7.65 
browning not nine millimeters so a little bit weaker but on the other hand it was a double action and single action pistol with a very safe firing pin block decocker system so there was a good deal of interest at the end of 1964 they would actually order 419 pistols from Walther, and of these, 415 would be the PPKL variant. And interestingly, at this time, even though these were assembled and proofed in Ulm, Germany, the parts were actually made in France by Nimenirhen. Anyway, they were received and adopted into the Swiss Luftwaffe in 1965, hence the name. And they were issued primarily and mostly to pilots. Now, interestingly, these were not issue guns that they took home. These were guns that belonged to the government. So they carried them when they need. And they did not carry them in a holster. They actually carried them in a specially crafted pocket in the flight suits, which would appear for the Mirage 3s and move on to the Tigers and what have you. So this would be the pistol that Swiss pilots would carry for um, several decades, frankly. Light and handy. Again, they were just off the standard production line. Now, as I said, they purchased 419, you know, 415 were the L's. Four of those were the standard steel frame PPK, which they wanted to test and evaluate. I guess they liked what they found that off because in 1971, they ordered 315 steel-framed PPKs, which were delivered in 1972 or thereabouts. And these would be only slightly heavier. Well, you know, they were 21 ounces, so 4 ounces heavier. So heavier, yes, but still a lot lighter than the 210 here. In all other ways, they were the same. Firing... 7.65 Browning, 32 Auto. And these were to be issued to ground crews. Not just those working on aircraft or in air bases, but also military police, air marshals, that kind of thing as well. And they would actually get a separate designation, essentially translating to self-loading pistol PPK. So together including the test models, they acquired 734 PPK and PPKLs between 1964 and 1972. And these would continue to serve through the late 80s, and then sometime in the 1990s they were surplused out and uh, were sold on the Swiss market and to some extent abroad in Europe. Unfortunately, they could not be sold in America because of the 1968 Gun Control Act, which set up a point system which the PPK and PPKL did not meet. This is also why there are very few PPKLs in America from the 1960s, because they only started making them in 64, and by 68 they were banned. So pretty narrow window there. But still it's neat, and this was pretty much the official sidearm of the uh, Swiss Luftwaffe for the 1970s and 80s. So kind of the time period we're looking at here with these aircraft. And with that, let's skip back over to the Tiger. In the 1970s, the role of the Swiss Luftwaffe was expanded. It was still, of course, very much in charge of air defense. But it was also given more of a ground assault, ground attack, close air support ability. Not only to work in conjunction with Swiss troops, but also there was the idea that if the Soviet Russians invaded, they could use their aircraft to attack the troops, attack the tanks, pinning them down in mountains and valleys and passes and whatnot. But after the debacle, the scandal of the Mirage, they were a lot more careful, a lot, a lot more oversight. 
and they had been playing around with the idea of a domestic design known as the P-16, developed at uh, the Federal Aircraft Factory at Emmen. Finally, this was put to bed, though, around 1972, and instead they would acquire more hunters. They would get 60 in total during the early to mid-70s. 52 would be the Mark 58A, which was a ground attack variant, and Eight would be the T-68 two-seat trainer. But these were just an interim measure. They were still flying older de Havilland's. They needed something, something new. So around 74, they looked at a few different aircraft, including the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom. They also looked at the Saab 37 Viggen. But the one that they ultimately went with after getting a couple of test examples was the Northrop F5E and F5F, the two-seat version, Tiger II. This was a more advanced version, a larger, more capable version of the original F5. And it, Northrop designed this aircraft to be kind of light, easy to maintain, just dependable, durable. And it mostly found success in East Asia and kind of the Third World. So it might seem a little unusual for a nation like Switzerland to go with a relatively conservative, although very good, aircraft. But again, after the whole debacle of trying to get the very best with the Mirage, they went this way. Um, but it wasn't a bad aircraft, not by any stretch. In 1976, the Swiss Air Force would order... 66 of the single seat and six of the two seat and these were to be initially built in the usa 13 of the e's and all six of the f's were built there and then the remainder 53 would be assembled under license at emmen and deliveries would commence in 1978 and run through 1979, allow, allowing the first squadrons to transition over. By doing this, it allowed them to free up the hunters out of the air defense role, which they were very ill-equipped for by the standards of the 1970s. And this is when all the older de Havilland's could retire, and these would become close air support aircraft and these were introduced as fighter interceptors to kind of work alongside the Mirage. And the Mirage was still the hot rod. Again this is a Mach 2 plus aircraft but the Tiger was no slouch. It's actually almost the exact same size about a 27 foot wingspan slightly shorter at about 48 feet it's a little bit slower at about Mach 1.6, a little bit lower of an altitude at about 52,000 feet. But it has two engines, very dependable, and it can still lift about 7,000 pounds. One's in the Swiss Luftwaffe, would typically carry two to four AIM-9 Sidewinders, plus retaining the two 20 millimeter cannon. And they could have external fuel tanks if necessary. By 1981, a third squadron had transitioned over. And a second order was placed for another 38. This would be 32 single seat and another six two seat trainers. And... All but a few of these would be built in Switzerland. And the order was complete by 1985. And this is kind of when the Tiger was at its peak in the country. Even the Swiss demonstration team would start to use them instead of the older hunters at this time. And so yeah, this was kind of the secondary air defense craft. 
But since they never had enough mirages, it really became the more common and it was very well liked. It was cheaper and easier to operate. It was easier to move in and out of the caves and caverns. And, uh, and we continue on for quite some time. And this model here is a 172 scale, as all of these are. This one's from Hobby Master. This one over here is from Corgi, the one of the Hunter. And this one, the Mirage 3, is from a company that's no longer a business that was known as Falcon. If you find these interesting, I do quite a few videos on my personal channel, just Nisha, on aircraft and other things, and I will have a more in-depth version of this video focusing on the aircraft over there. And with that, just as the Swiss military was expanding with its hardware in the 1970s, it would, of course, expand and develop new sidearms and actually would start working on new rifles, too. So, let's switch, switch back over to the firearms portion. The P-49, the 210, was a nice gun, but it was single action only, and it was expensive. Therefore, Switzerland was looking for a replacement that was both more modern and more economical. And that's exactly what they hit upon with what would become the SIG Sauer P-220. This was a joint product between SIG of Switzerland and J.P. Sauer and Son of Germany, well, West Germany. And while well, they had a few technological bits from Sauer, such as the decocker safety, the main thing was worldwide distribution because of Swiss export laws at the time. Either way, the partnership was set up and this went into production. It was actually quite an advanced pistol for the day and time, and was quickly adopted in 1975 by the Swiss military as the pistol 1975, the P-75. And many would go into the Luftwaffe too. It has an alloy frame and a stamped and rolled steel slide, which allowed it to be quite a bit lighter than the 210 at about 29 ounces. Still heavier than the Walther. It's in between on the size as well. It's about 7.7 .7 inches long with the barrel just under 4.5 inches. But its main advantage, it holds 9 rounds of 9mm and it's double double action with that well done decocking system and plenty of internal safeties and so that really made it appealing to the Swiss Air Force and the military version has a kind of matte blued finish it has the mag release on the heel it has a different shape to various components and the ones for switzerland were assembled using some german parts and some swiss parts in country now like i said this is the border guard version as it has this protector for the mag release here instead of a lanyard loop, but they are interchangeable. They're just not, uh, not terribly common in America. But because it was cheaper, lighter, and had the power of 9mm, it was appealing for certain roles in the Air Force. And so it started to replace the PPK first with ground crews, and then later even with pilots, especially as they would go on to newer aircraft like the FA-18 Hornet. And this is still 
the standard issue gun in Switzerland and the Swiss Armed Forces to this very day. They have others now, such as the Glock 17, Glock 19. They even use some of the SIG Pros. But this is by and large the most common handgun throughout the Army and the Air Force. It's a very nice gun. We've done several videos on these. And of course, this is what started off the whole family that would become the P225, and of course the P226, and P228, P229, and would lead to all the productions we know today. So a very significant gun, which explains why it's still around. I believe there's about 30,000 in Swiss service now, total. But with that, and talking about modernity, what about the Swiss Air Forces FA-18 Hornets? McDonnell Douglas FA-18 Hornet. And this was an aircraft specifically designed to operate from naval carriers. So, why would Switzerland have it? Not only does Switzerland not have an aircraft carrier, it is very much a landlocked nation, and its navy consists of a few boats on a few lakes. But actually, the dis it, it, it made sense. Going back to the 1980s, after successfully acquiring the F-5, and knowing that the Mirage fleet was too small and wouldn't last forever even after the upgrades, a new multi-role fighter was kind of needed. And several designs were looked at. Yet again, they looked at offerings from Saab. And they looked at the Mirage F1. They looked at a handful of others. But in 1988, they had a fly-off between the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon and the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet. And in October, it was announced that the Hornet was the winner. It should be added that in 1990, they did reopen the competition briefly to allow for the Dassault Mirage 2000. But in 1991, the choice of the F-A-18 was reaffirmed. And there was a vote in 1993. And it passed, and so it would be Switzerland's next generation of fighter interceptors. They were only acquiring the air defense version, both the single-seat FA-18C and the two-seat FA-18D. And their reasons for doing it were sound enough. In the U.S. Navy... This aircraft has sometimes been criticized for its relatively light payload, relatively low top speed, and relatively limited range. None of these things affect Switzerland. However, it's very good acceleration, very good maneuverability, and overall strong airframe are extremely well suited to their needs. And in fact, the version acquired was extremely similar to the Swiss, to the American naval version, except it was further reinforced and strengthened with titanium in certain areas because they wanted to give it a 30 year lifespan. Plus, you know, it just, it just made sense for them. It was bigger, though, than the previous aircraft at 56 feet by 40 feet, so. They had to expand their cavern system, something that took 20 years to do. Had a maximum speed of Mach 1.8, maximum altitude of about 50,000 feet, and could carry up to 13,000 pounds in payload. In the Swiss service, it would carry two AIM-9 Sidewinders, usually the later X version, and 
the AIM-120 AMROM. First the B version, but in more recent times this has been partially replaced by the newer C variant. And again, it did not have the ground attack capability. But of course, following the end of the Cold War, the Swiss Air Force's objectives changed. The idea for close air support ground attack virtually disappeared, became very minimalized, because there was no further danger of, you know, the Russians the Soviets invading by ground. These changes were put into law in 1995, and beginning in 1996, the Swiss Air Force was a totally independent agency from the Swiss Army. Prior to that, though, finally in 1994, the aging Hunter fleet was retired. They had discovered some wing-cracking so they had to be out. This meant they really didn't have a ground attack aircraft. They did try retrofitting some F-5s for this role. But this only met with partial success. And the Mirage fleet was definitely aging by this point. So they ordered 36... Excuse me, they ordered 26 single seat and 8 two seaters. The first one of each was to be built in the USA. And also in this time, this is about when McDonnell Douglas is going to be folded into Boeing. So the first two were built in the US. The first test flight was at the beginning of 1996. And then the remainder, 32, would be assembled from kits, again by the Federal aircraft factory at Emin, using mostly American parts, but also some parts from Swiss subcontractors as well. And the first Swiss assembled one would fly in October of 96, and deliveries to the Air Force would commence. The first squadron would transition over in 1997, and by the end of 1999, all had been delivered. It should be noted that one was destroyed during the workup process, so only 33 would go into service as the uh, 21st century would uh, kind of carry on. With the Hornet in service, this allowed the Luftwaffe to retire the Mirage fighter in 1999. So now the Hunter and the Mirage are fully out of service. They were also starting to retire older F-5s. The Reconnaissance Mirage would retire in 2003. Actually, just a short time later, 36 F-5s would be sold to the USA, purchased by the Navy. And so they're drawing down their F-5 fleet as well. This is because there have been major budget cuts throughout the Swiss Armed Forces. During this time period, several air bases closed. The personnel were drawn down. In fact, there was a second order planned for the F-18 Hornet that was canceled. And they also were planning to purchase air-to-surface munitions and retrofit the fleet to give it that secondary ground attack role. This never came to fruition either. And so, yeah. Now, some of these would be lost to accidents. Uh, three Ds over time and one C. Meaning that today, there are 30 FA-18s in Swiss service. Back around 2011, there was consideration given to the next generation. And yet again, they would tease Saab. And it actually came very close. The, the, the Saab 39, the Gripen, was picked in 2012. But via public referendum, public vote, the purchase was declined. So the FA-18 continues on to this very day. As do a few of the Tigers. 
because of the limitations in the Air Force now. 18 of the F-5Es are still in service, along with four F-5, F-2 seaters. Meaning that, really as far as fighters go, there are 52 in frontline Swiss service today. Currently, the Air Force has around 1,600 full-time personnel. True career military pilots are assigned, of course, to the F-A-18 fleet, meaning that reservists, usually drawn from commercial pilots, fly the F-5. And, of course, there are plenty of um, reconnaissance, transport, fixed-wing aircraft, as well as around 30 helicopters in the Air Force as well. And that's kind of the status of where we're at to this day. But let's wrap up by looking at what special units, such as the paratroopers, as well as some of the air marshals, need when a handgun is just not, just not quite enough. And again, if you like these models, you are welcome to check out my personal channel over at Misha. This hobby master here of a Swiss FA-18 is new of 2021 and a pretty neat little model. As is the complete history of the Hornet there. With that, let's get to our final firearm. And to wrap things up, we'll talk about SIG's SG-55X series as they pertain to the Swiss Air Force. And, I don't know, but the 552 just seems very Air Force-y. Like I said, in 1996, the Air Force kind of became its true, full, independent thing. And its role went essentially back to being air defense, interdiction, interception, as well as reconnaissance and uh, just protecting Swiss citizens. And one of the primary units under its auspices would be FSK-17, the Parachute Reconnaissance Group 17. This is a militia, meaning it's, you know, from con conscripts, but it operates under the direction of the Swiss Air Force today. And so they're, they're chosen from recruits as they come in at 17, and then 19 they select officers and who's going to be enlisted. They practice military parachute drops. They also work with the Petrio Swiss demonstration team. But anyway, usually a, a handgun would be more than enough. But sometimes you need something more of a submachine gun. And that's why SIG introduced the 552 in 1998. And it was based very much on their SG550, the STGW90, the standard issue rifle. But that had a 21 inch barrel. The new version had a barrel just under 9 inches. It used a new recoil system, short gas. And it had a removable flash hider, meaning the different devices, including suppressors, could be attached. Also adjustable gas with up to four ways for a suppressor, if ever needed. So, these went into service, being carried by parachutists. They just have the one division in Switzerland. They were also used, and still are, by uh, military police, air marshals. Most of these shorter guns are used under the auspices of the Swiss Special Operations Command. Originally, the 552 was adopted as the SGGW-04. 
And then when their updated 553 came along, we recently did a video kind of looking at the differences internally between 552 and 553. You can uh, check that out. The newer variant was adopted as the STGW07. Many of the older 04s were upgraded to the new standard, becoming STGW 0407s. And then finally, you could have the 07, which had a 13.7 inch barrel with the fixed flash hider, or the 07K, like this, they would have the 8.9 inch barrel and removable flash hider. And there are variations within those as well, but that gives you an idea. And the point of a short gun like this. Like I said, it's kind of in the machine gun, submachine gun range. It still fires 5.56 NATO, or in the case of Switzerland, 5.6 GP90. And gives a little extra oomph than a pistol. But it's still quite compact with its stock folded up and without a suppressor on the barrel. And so you can understand why special forces, paratroopers, reconnaissance, commandos, military police, heck even maybe some medics and whatnot might like to have this type of gun. Whereas this, the long barrel version, the 13.7, is kind of used as more of a de facto carbine alongside the SDGW-90 rifle, the K version here is very much a specialist's gun and not issued in huge numbers. But still, uh, several thousand are in Swiss service. And at least as of a couple of years ago, there were still some 5.52s, STGW-04s, unconverted around. I don't know how many still reside to this day. It's also worth pointing out that the original ones were diopters only. But then, in the 21st century, they would introduce a Picatinny rail version, first with the late 5.52 production, and then following through with 5.53 production. And these days, pretty much any Swiss military 553 will have the pick rail. I don't know. I just thought it would be nice to kind of bring it out and talk about it. Since, obviously, this is not going in the cockpit of a fighter. But it could be, say, on board a helicopter in the seat. <clears throat> or used on a transport plane if security were needed. Or, of course, used to defend bases on the ground, installations, assets, things of that nature, alongside handguns, and, of course, the standard SGGW-90 rifle, too. But it is quite a bit lighter, so it has a very important role. And for more on this, we've done many videos on the 5.5X family, so you can... Uh, check those out and with that let's kind of wrap things up well i hope you enjoyed this model and gun video i did one a few years ago on a couple of swiss things but i thought it'd be fun to kind of expand it unfortunately you can't really find the pistol 65 here in America because of the 1968 Gun Control Act and the point systems, the little PPK, especially the PPK-L with its lighter weight is not legal. So I guess I just feel fortunate to have this World War II Dural version. And you don't see many of the Swiss production P-75s because the army ones are still considered current so that's why only a few of these like this border guard version have come over but it's still neat and of course we have a number of SG-55X guns thanks to JDI Sand Imports today and this was a quite a limited run of 5.52s I could have brought out a 5.53 for this video, but I don't know. I just felt like doing this one. And yeah, if you're if you kind of like aircraft models, unfortunately Falcon is is kind of long out of production, but the Hobby Masters are still gettable and uh, kind of interesting for what they are. These are both truly Swiss paint schemes here, whereas this is just a French one. 
But, yeah. I just like seeing how things relate to history. And uh, hopefully you do too. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to the Patreon page. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.